I willingly share the parts of my practice that I feel comfortable sharing or want to share with people. Um, which someone asked how I decided that was gonna be her tree. It's just the only pine in my yard and had a nice little space for an altar. So that's just where I put my outdoor altar to her. <laughs> um, and that's how I decided. <laughs> And then I was like, do you like it? And she was like, here's a crow. And I'm like, nice. Hi witches, welcome back to my channel. Today I am answering your questions about my practice. There's a lot of them. So I'm gonna get as through as many as I possibly can while also making sure I'm staying hydrated. I separated them into different categories because there were a few like overarching themes. There's, you know, and there will obviously, you know, be timestamps on the bottom. There's like around my practice or my practices around rituals and offerings, tools, all of this is around my practice, but like more specifically research and books, folk Catholicism, and Italian folk magic, spirit work and ancestors, deities, and then miscellaneous. So we're going to start off just launching into the practice section. What is your practice like daily? I think this is a great question and I'm gonna be honest, it changes depending on the week, depending on how much time I have, depending on what kind of work I need to do that week. Um, if you are interested in kind of seeing a little more of my daily practices, I recommend watching like my week in the life videos, like a, a week of folk magic, um, a week in the my life, you know, a week with a folk witch, anything like that, because those videos are kind of, for the most part, showing me showing what my practice looks like on a daily basis and you know sometimes it is just waking up veiling lighting a candle i actually have one of my spell candles going now lighting a candle putting on an oil going to work i don't tend to do a lot more spell work in the winter months and i'm going to make a video about that as well so you speak a lot on the mundane but how do you bring magic into your daily practice some of the things i just mentioned but also there is a level i think that when I got to a certain point, the mundane and the magic became one and the same for me. So the mund thing, mundane things I do are infused with magic and the magic I do are infused with the mundane. So there is magic in my practice every day, in what I eat, in what I wear, in how I carry myself, what oils I'm wearing, what kind of things I have to get done that day. I do have like certain more kind of fleshed out spells that I do every month, which I would love to make a video on that if people are interested. But for the most part, I think at this point in my practice, it's very difficult to distinguish between magic and mundane. I think folk magic created this essence of practicality and necessity for me. And so I tend not to kind of go overboard with attempting to get as much magic as possible and because it already is there. It just looks a little different than it used to be. What have you found the most fulfilling about your practice or what gets you out of bed in the morning? I think my relationship with my ancestors is very much what is getting me out of bed in the morning. Being able to run a shop and work with people and work within my community and have friends that I can talk to about witchcraft and folk magic, that is really important for me. And that ultimately I think is what gets me, mo what is the most fulfilling. What gets me out of bed is the fact that I can always learn more. <laughs> I can always know more. I can always do more. I, there's always something new for me to learn. And that is where I get out of bed in the morning. How did you start your practice or what did you study the most first? I think this is a difficult question to answer because I wasn't really studying at the beginning of my practice. I was just trying to find as much information as possible and absorb it and implement it. I didn't really have something that I was like spending years in dedication to or even months or weeks. I was just kind of reading books and implementing them. And I did kind of start in like with books on Wicca, but that was also mostly what was available to me at the time. What was the hardest lesson in your practice? No, no from spirits, no from spells, no from ancestors, or I maybe the hardest one that I got from my ancestors specifically was we're not going to give this to you till it's the right time or till you've earned it. And I fully believe this is like the matrix. There's like couple, a couple women in my family that are, I like guide me mostly. And <laughs> some of them I'm like, Hmm. Okay. Like very like tough love almost. Uh, you're not ready. I'm not giving it to you. Or like, I have to work for answers. I have to work for receiving things from them. And that I think, and that this is the, the, you know, the 
ancestors that guide me the most in like Italian folk magic. There are other ancestors that guide me in different ways or guide me in different areas. But in Italian folk magic, there is definitely a level of like, you're not getting this until you've earned it or you, you're not getting this until you're ready. So that was a hard lesson to learn very quickly. In what direction do you see your practice evolving in the coming years? I mean, I just, I think I stopped trying to figure out where I wanted to be and how I wanted to end up and I'm just kind of riding it. And I don't have any idea of where I'm gonna be in a couple years. Hopefully somewhere similar to where I am now. I mean, I don't think I'm gonna like change paths or completely change the work I'm doing or my content or anything, but I definitely am not, you know, I'm gonna be a different person, right? But I don't know. And that's okay. Your most spiritually significant song in your playlist. Anything by Florence and the Machine. That's some good witchcraft in music. Florence and the Machine. How does making oils for your shop affect that relationship with that spirit? I don't know if I completely understand what you're asking, so I'm gonna try my best to answer. The relationship with that spirit, I think it either becomes a lot more intimate or it becomes a lot more transactional, depending on whether or not the spirit and I have a relationship, the spirit and I have a kind of rapport. If I'm like, it's a plant or a herbal ally or a spirit that I work with a lot and I already have a really good relationship with. It just kind of becomes more intimate. If it's a spirit that I'm kind of petitioning for help with an oil, I'm going to have it be more transactional. And it kind of depends on which spirit, what is it for, and my relationship already with them. How do you balance your practice and your life? I don't. <laughs> I don't, I haven't mastered that yet and that's okay. I think that my, like I said with the mundane and magic question, my practice has in many ways just become my life and become so embedded into my life that it is very hard for me to see the differences between like my life and my practice. Obviously there are times where I'm not, you know, actively practicing, like I'm not gonna actively practice at like, going out with friends or like hanging out with friends. But there, so I have hobbies, but it's also like, my practice is just in everything. It's in, like I said, in what I eat, in how I operate, in how I do things. And I don't really have the ability to separate them at this point. <laughs> like, I don't know what I would do if suddenly someone was like, you have to stop practicing. Cause it's just like, I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just, clean normally and not throw salt around the house. I think that's also a byproduct of being a, from a folk magic of a culture, like of a people. Like I, it's not just my practice that is in my life. It is my literal like beliefs. It's a liter it's who I am. It is defining for me as an Italian American. And because of that, the folk magic is just next. The reconnection to the people came first and then the folk magic. What is your favorite low on spoons way of practicing? I like oils. <laughs> I usually just anoint things, anoint myself. Um, if I really need it, I'll make a simmer pot if I can with a bunch of herbs in it, which I need to do today. It's Sunday, Sunday simmer pot day. Um, and I think for me, if I'm really low on spoons, I'm not doing shit. <laughs> I really am not doing anything. I am in bed, like not operating. Um, I will usually do like some sort of prayer novena um, because that I can do for my bed. But honestly, I'm not doing anything if I'm sick. I just kind of, maybe I'll make some healing food, you know? And that's my, that's my low spoons thing. So we're wrapping up the kind of general practice area. We're moving into rituals and offerings, tools. Do you have a favorite ritual? I really like the spell that I do with like um, the money magic I do, the abundance magic I do with um, the allies that are in that and associated with that. And that I think is something that I'm really proud of. It's gone really well for me and I continue to con continue to do it. So I would say that's my, probably my favorite. And so that's something that like I posted the information of like the general ritual on my Instagram as a reel a long time ago called like La Bambolina Magica. But apart from that, I probably won't ever share more about the money magic I do just because I am superstitious and I don't like sharing that kind of stuff. Was there a proper way to dispose of offerings? 
Depends on the tradition, depends on the deity, depends on the spirit, it depends so much on everything because my answer is going to be completely different from someone come from like a, a different tradition. Um, so I'd look at, you know, the pantheon you're working in, right, and information on how those offerings from that pantheon were disposed of, like uh, being, were they burned as offerings? Were they left at a crossroads? Were they thrown into a trash can? So it's like, you have to look at the anthropological and information before you can really answer that. So no, there's no proper way. There is gonna be like, ways within your tradition or within the deity, deity's pantheon that may be more traditional. Do you prefer working with scented or unscented candles for spell work? I don't actually have a preference. I feel like scented candles, if they match with my intention, are great. I'm very much a beeswax and soy wax girly. I will use paraffin if that's all I have. However, I just kind of like how soy wax burns more. It doesn't tunnel as bad in my experience and I really like beeswax and how it burns, especially taper candles. I don't have a preference, honestly. Like I think what I use is mostly unscented, but I'm also like just, those are just the candles that I end up getting. <laughs> Does olive oil from Italy feel different than olive oil from King Supers? You can get olive oil from Italy at King Supers. Or like, they said like Walmart or grocery store. King Supers is like my grocery store, so I'm just using that. I do like the olive oil that's actually from Italy more than I like just a random olive oil. And I think that's because of the quality. I like the taste better. It's not really about like, even if I'm like using an ancestry, like use whatever you have on hand. But for me, I like like, I, I like <laughs> the one brand of olive oil that I like and I don't change it. And that's kind of just what I use. I use Bertoli, extra virgin. I'm also, you know, making oils with that, with like olive oil a lot of the time. I just like the taste, I like the quality of it, and that's kind of why I use it. Um, I'd get olive oil from other places too. <laughs> I just prefer, I like the Italian one. What surprised you the most about your practice? Any spells or rituals that became more important than you expected? Any sort of money magic, I feel like, like abundance magic. I feel like especially when I launched a business and started selling products and began that kind of journey, it became really important and foundational to my business to do that kind of magic, to do that kind of working, which any good is business owner, witchy business owner, in my opinion, is doing that. <laughs> if you don't, that's fine, start. So I had two questions around veiling and they really only were, why do you cover your head or what is the reason behind veiling? So for me, covering my head kind of became and started as like a comfort thing and a protection thing. It has kind of evolved at this point to be very devotional, not just to my ancestors, but to deities, to spirit, to kind of anything along those lines. It really is kind of a dedication or physical symbol of that devotion to my practice. At the same time, uh, there are a lot of beliefs about hair in Italian and Italian American folk magic and hair being kind of something that can be used to cure or curse hair that can be something like kind of like very powerful and because of that I find myself to be more comfortable veiling just to kind of cover this part even though I don't cover it like completely I do cover it to an extent to honor that superstition and that belief of like hair being powerful hair having the power to curse or cure Everyone knows like a hair is a tag lock, but there are so many superstitions and beliefs around hair. Like you cannot cut your hair when you are pregnant. You uh, have to wait to a certain age to cut a little girl or a little boy's hair. And it's just kind of a very much a, like a space where we have a lot of beliefs about it. There are a lot of things that can be done with it. So I cover my hair a lot of the time because of that. And you'll see like, there are some times where I don't wear a veil. That's probably because I'm either exercising or I'm in a situation where I'm comfortable not wearing it. But especially when I am kind of putting myself out as a public figure, I'm at work, I'm in a space where like workings are happening, I'm at a metaphysical shop, I do cover my head. Any situation where there's a lot going on, a lot of people and a lot of energy you'll see me wearing a veil research in books so the someone asked if i knew any trustworthy sites for research 
So the thing I realized is that you're not gonna find one site that's trustworthy. It's about finding a collection and then cross-referencing. <laughs> and from there too, I mean, I use like academia.edu to get like research articles. Uh, they will, the writers will put their like actual papers for free up on the website. You just have to make an account. And I use that a lot for any sort of academic papers. And from there, I mean, I just kind of start on a Google and maybe I'll go to like Google papers <laughs> and I will just start researching and start looking, find something, check their sources, go to those sources, go from there. Um, it also really depends on kind of what you're researching. If you're researching like history, you're gonna to wanna to look for more history websites. If you're researching folk magic, you're gonna to wanna to look for practitioners uh, or academics, this kind of stuff. How do you keep your research? This is a great question. I put it in my notes app on my phone and eventually I will <laughs> write it down. <laughs> I'm not organized um, with that section. I usually just grab it and paste it and forget about it. <laughs> And eventually it'll make its way into like a grimoire book of shadows um, or a spell book. But for a while, in like a year or two, it'll just sit in a notes app and I'll just refer to it whenever I need. <laughs> book recs for Italian folk magic. So I have done these before. It's okay that you like missed it. I know you said they're like, I may have missed it. Totally fine. Italian folk magic by Mary Grace Farn. Burn a Black Candle by Dean Norman. Della Medicina, which is coming out October 2024 four by Lisa Fazio, um, creator and owner of The Root Circle. Any writings on the blog of Mary Beth Bonfiglio, I adore. Any writings by Simaruda Remedies, I adore. Also a blog. Uh, I like the Trotula, more of an academic thing. Magic, A Theory from the South by Ernesto Di Martino, Power and Magic in Italy by Thomas Hosschild, uh, Italian Folk Tales by Italo Calvino, The Things We Do, Ways of the Holy Benedetta by Augustino Tomatorgio, uh, yeah, I think that's all of them. I'm missing some definitely, like in my head. Oh, Honoring Your Ancestors by Mallory Badwitz. There's definitely more that I've used, but that's what I recommend. Definitely start with like Italian Folk Magic by Mary Grace Farrant. What is one topic you study that would surprise people? I guess this may not be surprising to people, but it depends on how long you've been following my channel. I am very interested in the kind of preparation of, um, of bones of dead animals. So I have studied like how you process bones. I've studied the best way to do it, how to do it. And I'm, you know, actively practicing. You'll probably see a video about this later um, in the spring because it's really hard to macerate when it's freezing out. Anyways, now we have questions on folk Catholicism and Italian folk magic, mostly folk Catholicism. How did you start researching folk Catholicism? So I didn't, I just kind of, I don't even know if I research. I mean like, so the thing with folk Catholicism and someone asked me like, hey, can you explain it more? Folk Catholicism is in a lot of ways a relationship with the people of, a, of the religion and the spirits of the religion outside the confines of the church. And so folk Catholicism is gonna have a lot of definitions. A lot of people are gonna disagree on what it means, what it looks like, etc. Folk Catholicism, it still has elements of Catholicism that are kind of set in the structure of the Catholic church, of the belief system of the religion. But I always say like, there are things that folk Catholics do that the church would not agree with and disapproves of, or trad Catholics would hate. And in the same way, <laughs> the folk Catholicism of different regions, places, cultures is gonna be very different. So if you're looking into folk Catholicism, a kind of general aspect of it, you're gonna be looking a lot of the time at a specific culture or, relig or like practice to understand that folk Catholicism. Because like the folk Christianity of hoodoo is very much different from the folk Catholicism of Italian American folk magic. And then that's in turn very different of like German folk magic. It's very different um, from Mexican American folk Catholicism and folk magic, Irish folk magic. They're all kind of have differences in them. And the reason is because the Catholicism of those religions and those practices is not just the it's not just the Catholic Church. It's 
the Catholicism and the religion of a people. It's influenced by the land, it's influenced by beliefs, it's influenced by needs, it's influenced by history. It is, like I said, a relationship with spirits outside of the confines of the Catholic Church, but it's also culture embedded into it. So the folk Catholicism I study is very different from other cultures folk Catholicism. And when I first started studying, I think I started with Sister Carol's book of folk magic spells Catholic, like and like folk magic, which is very much baseline folk Catholicism. There's no really, there's some cultural references, some uh, information in there, but it really is just kind of like folk Catholicism by itself, which you can get and you can do. And like I said, everyone's gonna have a different opinion on what that means, <laughs> but for me, my folk Catholicism is not just, you know, my relationship with Catholic spirits or relationship with saints outside of the church or doing things that the church disapproves of. It is also very much like Italian American folk Catholicism. There are things that are very much Italian American traditions within that folk Catholicism that are syncretized with it. Um, shout out to the guy in my comment section who was like, you're not a Catholic. Your ancestors were Catholic and you're a pagan. If you want to honor them, just be Catholic. Sparkles. No. <laughs> Thank you. Do you feel guilt about mixing the Catholic parts of your practice? Great question. I used to. And I think I just got to a point where what I was doing felt so natural to me and felt so right that I stopped feeling guilt because I found a community of people doing the same thing I was. And I was like, oh my God, we all do it. So it felt better once I realized that I wasn't just the only one. Like I didn't pull my practice out of my ass, right? And make it up. There are other people whose practices in my community look very similar to mine, who have very similar relationships to saints that I do, have very similar relationships to gods that I do, and our practices may look different, but some of the core elements are the same. So whenever everyone's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm just like, my thing. I also wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised who was I raised? I wasn't really raised inside of a church. We did go to Protestant church like a couple times. Maybe it was Lutheran. It was another branch. I didn't grow up with like Catholic guilt. <laughs> so I think that there's a lot that is easier for me than someone who maybe grew up with religious trauma. And I want to validate that very quickly. Opinions on Saint Punishing or examples on sa of Saint Punishing? Few things. I am not very familiar with Saint Punishing. Saint Punish, I don't really have an opinion on Saint Punishing because of that, because it's very important to certain traditions and certain cultures. My kind of Saint Punishing methods are very mild compared to some other ones, and that's fine. Here's the thing, if it's part of a tradition, it's just what has been done, and it's, you know, part of the folk magic, it's kind of like, okay, like, I don't have an opinion on that, it's not my folk magic, you know? So, I don't, I don't really care if you Saint Punish. <laughs> I my like feelings about it doesn't define whether or not someone else can or can't do it. Um, I come from a family, at least in my family, where like St. Punishing I guess was frowned upon. And I don't know if that's an Italian American thing or just my family thing. It was just kind of like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just ask him nicely? And I'm like, okay, so that's kind of my mindset. But that's also like, not to ignore the cultural context and cultural importance of different traditions of saint punishing. So an example of saint punishing is like tying a saint statue up and flipping them upside down and riding them underwater when they don't do something. <laughs> I personally, there are few saints that I'd be okay with saint punishing, and then there's some that I'd be absolutely petrified of. So I just kind of avoid it. <laughs> what are your experiences working with archangels? Depends on which one. Archangels are interesting. Everyone has a different opinion of how to work with them. Everyone has a different idea of how to work with them. I kind of approach it from a folk magic standpoint where the archangels are kind of like, well, the saints were at one point human so they can help with human things. My experience with archangels is that they aren't necessarily going to help with human things if you ask. So I really only go to them in dire situations. And this is different depending on which archangel we're talking about. If we're talking about Michael, Michael, 
I only go to him in desperate situations. Typically protection and justice. I do also think that I need to give him credit um, for protecting my car. St. Raphael does it mostly because I petition him for safe travels, um, but also that guy. Because I got a rosary in my car with St. Michael on it and the amount of things that I should have been pulled over for that I didn't, those two really did it. Okay. I feel like there's this kind of idea of like, I don't know, feeling the presence of an archangel. I've never seen an archangel. I haven't felt the presence of an archangel. The closest I've ever gotten is ingesting one of St. Michael's like holy plants, gar a garlic flower essence, saying a prayer to him, and then like having an experience. And that's okay. I'm all right with that being it for right now. <laughs> I don't think people understand that like the presence of an archangel is supposed to be terrifying enough to like kill you. So when people ask me what it's like working with them, I'm like, I mean, it's pretty detached. I just know like I could get some confirmation that things are happening. Just things are going in my favor or I'm safe or and I and then I happen to find like something like a metal, a Saint metal, like an Archangel Michael metal in my car. I'm like, oh, Michael. So it's really like folk magic and that kind of element of my practice is very, you know, practical, very necessity based. So I really don't. I mean, there are ways that I devote myself to them, dedicate space to them. Like I give them altars, I give them petitions, I give them offerings, but I really am not like actively like, hey buddy, unless I need something and that's okay. How do you connect with the saints? I don't really know how to answer this. I mean, connecting, uh, most of the time I'm just making space for them. I'm giving them a statue, I'm creating something for them. A lot of the saints or archangels I work with, I'm like actively working on creating oils for them. And I think that is the way that I devote myself to them. Sometimes I'll pray to them um, or at, do prayers to them if I really need to. But there's a level of like, once you petition a saint, or an archangel a certain amount of times and every single time it is answered there's kind of a like relationship foundation that is there that i just have all the time like i know in situations if i'm <laughs> you know rough spot i know who i can petition to answer me if i am forming a relationship with a saint there's a lot more time spent on building a sacred space for them giving them offerings being very mindful with with what kind of petitions I am doing and making sure that what is promised is given. And then we go from there. So there's a saint that I work with, Saint Expedite, that no one in my family has ever worked with. I am the first to, to my knowledge, I'm the first to build a relationship with him. Um, and for a while, there was definitely not a lot of movement in terms of, of things that like, were happening because we hadn't had, didn't have a strong relationship and now our relationship is stronger. He knows I'm gonna give him his offering so he's a little bit more likely to help me. What is your experience with St. Mary? I don't know, I mean, Mary is the mother. She's the Virgin Mary, right? I, my experience with her is I know that if I need something, if I know if I have no idea who to talk to, I just go to Mary and I think my kind of devotion and dedication to her in a lot of ways is you know spending time praying the rosary spending time creating things for her kind of my connection with Rose in a lot of ways is akin to my connection with Mary and similar to how Rue is my connection with Diana but Rose is kind of Mary in a lot of aspects, like it's one of Mary's flowers and my kind of work with Rose and connection with her very much is uh, parallel to or a part of my connection with Mary. And so I think that practical aspect makes it kind of very grounded. But honestly, Mary is one of those saints, one of those entities that I knew if I needed her, prayed to her, she would come, she would help. What are your thoughts on witches who work with demons or Satan? I don't have any thoughts. I don't care. I, I it's not that like I don't care, like I think it's cool. I I mean good for you. Like I good for you. That's awesome. I hope you have a good time. Uh, I 
am not a like Christian, I'm not going to tell you that you're a bad person for working with demons or Satan or anything along those lines. I think Satanists are pretty cool people. Um, just like I think witches who work with like the folkloric devil are really cool or who invoke demons are really cool. I have no thoughts. <laughs> I just, I don't know why if this is, was like a, because I'm folk Catholic, they think that I don't like witches who work with demons or Satan. I don't really care. I don't work with them. Have you ever tried to put a demon and a Michael in a room? I, I just like... I don't, my ancestors made it very clear very early on that that was not going to be happening and that was okay uh, for me. And that's my path. You do you, you know? I have no, I, I really don't have any thoughts. I think what you do is cool. I hope you have a good time. Is Italian folk magic closed? I love this question because it really depends on who you ask. Because I have an opinion and then I talk to people who are in Italy who are Italian and they have an opinion that's completely different. And then <laughs> I talk to teachers who have an opinion of, that is completely different from mine. So I, there's no answer. I think my kind of point of view is this. I always kind of ask people, you know, if you're not Italian or Italian American, what is the purpose of learning it? Why are you pulled to it? Are you respecting the cultural context and are you kind of recognizing the folk and active in that community and that's why you're part of the folk magic like i know people who have kind of learned most of their practice from southern italians in places where they are not from and they to me i consider them like southern italian practitioners because they are versed in that magic or most of their teachings came from them even if they're like from a different area of italy right but I mean, my friend uh, in Sicily was, would be like, well, I don't, I mean, I just give it to you. Like, you know, I just, if you're interested, I want to give it to you. So like I said, it depends on who you ask. For me, I willingly share the parts of my practice that I feel comfortable sharing or want to share with people. There are definitely things that I feel like need to be transmitted a certain way. Um, and there are definitely things and people that I feel like have in the past taken things, at least in Italian American folk magic, you know, out of, out of the context, uh, like commentary of appropriation has happened. Um, all of these conversations are occurring within the community as we speak, and I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> Here's the thing, if you're interested in Italian folk magic, read about it, learn about it, see where it takes you, connect with the community and kind of become in embedded and versed and connected with the community and go from there. I don't think there's anything wrong with learning about it it's not in, there are certain aspects of the practice that are like a very in, similar to initiatory. Even that is changing as diaspora changes, as, P, as new practitioners come in. So here's the thing, folk magic is changing all the time. There's no yes or no answer. It's not a yes, this is closed, and no, this is not closed. It's somewhere in between, as many things are, with a living, breathing practice. I don't have an answer for you. So, sorry about that. <laughs> How did you build your community or start building your community? I started by beginning to connect with other Italian American diasporic practitioners. I first started on TikTok and then moved to Instagram. I found people who were other, just Italian Americans practicing, even if they weren't doing like Italian American folk magic. I started following them and then I started kind of seeing who was who they were talking to and who they were promoting and then i followed them and then you know i started taking classes with people and then i followed them and then uh, from there i was looking at the other teachers and i followed them and a lot of times you just kind of become in it and you're like cool it, it, that community already existed when i was there you know and i have the people around me that um, I'm very close with that I love, that are my peers, that I kind of met through social media, Instagram, etc., Patreon. Um, but a lot of times they found me. And I think that a big thing with building the community is putting yourself out there and putting yourself and your journey out there, which is absolutely fucking terrifying. But a lot of times people will not see you if you are not contributing actively to the community. It's a give and take, right? That doesn't mean you have to post like informational content, but just like sharing things or, you know, sharing things with people that you meet. It's not just kind of like a 
I started posting about Italian American folk magic and everyone was like, oh my God, Frankie. And my community emerged from that. It was already there. I just became part of it. We're scooting along to spirit work and ancestors. How do you start communicating with spirits? I really like the good old fashioned Oracle deck. <laughs> That's where I began. I think that there are benefits to working with psychic powers, working on intuition, working through kind of mental blocks, whether spirit communication is coming from like something external or your own thoughts. For me, the way that I kind of distinguish between like, okay, this feels like, you know, something from a spirit and something from me is if I'm thinking or if I'm asking a question and something random pops in. But then again, there's a lot of trust in myself with that that has grown over time. Um, a lot of doubt that had to be worked through, a lot of space and time that had to be worked through. But what I found is that as I started trusting myself, my intuition, the kind of things I was getting, the things I was feeling that I was supposed to do or how that spirit or entity was communicating with me, I would act on it and then receive confirmation. And that confirmation is what gets you there. So if you really don't know, you know, I, I start with being like, send me something physical. Send like, okay, do you mean this? Send this, do you mean this? Send this. I start there and then I slowly kind of start building a relationship with that spirit, learning how to connect with them, learning how to notice the changes as they're more active in my life. How do you feel when honoring some ancestors who may not have been great people? I have been waiting three years for this question. I love you. Thank you. So here's the thing that I love to talk about. We all have ancestors who were not great people. This especially, I'm talking to like white people. You, you definitely had ancestors that were racist, that were not good people, that actually like caused tangible harm to not only your family maybe, but also like everyone around you, right? So, but we all have ancestors and you can all think off the top of your head right now, someone that in your family that you're like, I really don't like them. I don't think they're a good person. I don't wanna to speak to them. Maybe you just dislike them. Maybe you just don't get along. Maybe you feel like they treated you or another member of your family badly. I can think of several living family members off the top of my head. So I don't venerate my not great ancestors. If I have bad ancestors, I don't actually put them on an altar because I don't want to venerate someone who wasn't a great person. That doesn't mean that I ignore them. I think there's this in-between space between venerating ancestors and ignoring those ancestors that needs to be met especially for healing generational trauma. Healing trauma to yourself, to your family, and to other communities. And that is recognizing the harm that was done or by those ancestors that were not great people, making sure it doesn't happen again. Healing it. Not even healing it, but like taking active steps to ensure that doesn't happen again. If you wanna go so far as to heal those ancestors and to heal that, you can, but I also know a lot of people don't are uncomfortable with that. I personally feel as though a way of healing intergener like intergenerational or generational trauma from bad ancestors is by ensuring that you are not them. It is by ensuring that those cycles don't continue and that you take active steps to not be them. So that's my opinion. And here's the thing is that's just my practice and my opinion. It is not an authority. You could, can do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean like, you know, but I personally, for me, it is very, very important and very big in reconnection to ensure that as I reconnect, I am acknowledging and problematic beliefs, pro problematic thinking patterns, problematic ways of being that my ancestors held that I do not want in my life. And I don't want to continue down my generational line. That could be something really minor and that could be something really major. All depends. What is your favorite way to venerate ancestors? Food. Someone 
asked, what kind of food do your ancestors want you to cook right now? They're big in the soups. We're in the soup, soup season, so I've been making a lot of soup. Uh, cannellini bean soup, lentil soup, chicken soup, pasta fagioli, pasta fagioli. And like, <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. Soup, bread, very hearty, nutritious meals. And that's my favorite way to venerate my ancestors because you can actually just feel it. I made pastina for the first time the other day. Child, childhood, that was my childhood. What has been a big building block in your ancestral veneration practice? Recognizing that my ancestral veneration practice is not going to look like the people who came before me. It's not gonna look the same as my peers. It's not gonna look the same as my teachers. It is going to be different and that's okay. Because they are my ancestors. They are my family and they are asking me for different things than other people's ancestors. Also the kind of piece of like, you don't have to venerate bad ancestors, but you should acknowledge the shit they did and make sure it doesn't happen again. How do I connect with ancestors who I don't know the names of or don't have records of? So this is really, you don't need records. So if you have ancestors um, who you are connected with, like biologically or even like adoptive wise, you're holding them inside you. You have their, their knowledge, right? So all you have to do, take a white candle, right? To all the ancestors, known and unknown, this is to honor you. Or when I want to include ancestors who I don't know the names of, I say to all my ancestors un who names are, whose names are unknown. So I think this person was also saying that they were Jewish and their family members died in the Holocaust. I am not Jewish, so I am not familiar with the traditions of ancestor veneration in Judaism. I would recommend Jew Witches page for that. And they may have a few things on that, but for me, you don't need pictures, you don't need names. All you need to do is recognize who they were as like, who, like that they existed. Recognize they existed and honor them through that. Maybe even by being, in a lot of ways, proudly who you are, you are honoring them. Because they weren't able to do that. That is just an example. Once again, I am not Jewish. Go to Jew witches. How do you see the entities you work with and how do you see Diana? So I think I used to imagine them as physical, more physical people. And now, I kind of see Diana in like every, a lot of wild, wild, wild things. I see her in the mountains. I see her in the pine tree in my backyard. Um, which someone asked how I decided that was gonna be her tree. It's just the only pine in my yard and had a nice little space for an altar. So that's just where I put my outdoor altar to her. <laughs> um, and that's how I decided. <laughs> And then I was like, do you like it? And she was like, here's a crow. And I'm like, nice. So uh, it wasn't a big decision. I was just like, this looks like a nice space for an altar and it's a pine tree, ta-da. So I see her in the pine trees. I see her in the animals I interact with. So the deities I work with, um, Diana, someone did ask if I still worship or work with deities. Great question, other than Diana. I also kind of um, work with or worship Mercury and I work with her worship, Fortuna, Lady Senora Fortuna, or Lady Luck. Um, and those are the kind of three that are in my space, but also Mercury is, for me, kind of a god, kind of a planet, kind of an energy signature. <laughs> there is, he's, it's like, yes, he's Roman and he's a god, but he's also like a planet and he's also a vibe. So Mercury, I think the way I connect with Mercury oftentimes is through other entities that hold that mercurial energy signature, whether that's a plant, a saint, um, an animal, right? And then Fortuna, uh, I don't really see Fortuna as anything. I see Fortuna in all the ways that I have seen myself get lucky in the past. <laughs> in the past like time since I've been working with her, like a tree falling in my backyard and falling away from the fence. Because it could have fallen towards the fence too. Or finding a lucky penny or leaving five minutes late for work, but somehow getting there on time. Um, all the small ways that I am blessed by fortune and blessed by luck, that is how I see Lady Fortuna. That is what I see her as. And Diana, I see her in the trees, in the animals, in a bow and arrow, in hunting, in mountains. I am the most 
kind of at home with her in the mountains and because deer and dogs are her sacred, sacred animals. Um, I see, whenever I kind of see a deer, I see it as like a messenger or symbol from Diana. Uh, but the big tree that I connect with her through is pine. It kind of has energy and also La Sila is very close to my ancestors' hometown and I have a connection with pine because of that as well. How, what is your favorite way to implement devotion in your practice for your deities? I love wearing jewelry dedicated to them. Um, I love wearing oils devoted and dedicated to them. And I love personally like finding a nice perfume that reminds me of them and wearing it. That's my vibe. Those are the ways I do it. That's not very big, right? But like past that devotion and dedication looks like making sure they receive their offerings, making sure that they, you are like doing things in honor of them. So it's like, what do you do in honor of them? And then you go from there. So this was from Herman. How do you bless a sword for a duel? Firstly, I'm gonna need to borrow a sword from you for a duel. If you're not following Herman, you should be. Hi, I'm Herman. I mean, you could probably just like run a nice, like, you just like sign of the cross, Hail Mary is one way. Uh, you could like do like hold it up to the sun and ask the sun to bless it. Uh, you could stick it in snow and ask the ice to bless it. You could also just kind of like hold it in your hands like this and like be like, no, 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 I bless you. Duh, like actually just treat it as like a living thing, like an animistic spirit, go from there. Now we're in like miscellaneous area. That was from Herman. This is the other miscellaneous question I got. Any unpopular opinions surrounding Wicca and paganism? I am still consistently petty over the media saying that Wicca and witchcraft are the same. And I will continue <laughs> in that area and being frustrated with that until it no longer becomes an issue. I don't really have any, I mean, I kind of, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but I feel like there's this feeling that, at least sometimes that I see, that like pagan communities are better and unproblematic. I don't agree with that. And maybe this was just like my point of view. I don't know, but like, I just, and it's not an unpopular opinion. I think people should know that like, shitty people still exist in pagan circles. Shitty people still exist everywhere. Racist people still exist everywhere. People who do problematic shit still exist everywhere. And a lot of times in spiritual communities, especially paganism, they do it under the guise of that. That's how cults happen. Like Christian cults exist, but also like new age spiritual cults exist, which that's not paganism. But and so, and I think that it was so funny to me when I, which by the way, I made a video on YouTube a year ago where I was like, I no longer identify as pagan and no one saw it. And then I made an Instagram reel and everyone lost their fucking minds. Here's the thing. When I made that video, there was an equal amount of traditional Catholics and an equal amount of pagans on my page harassing me because of what I said. Because I just said that I don't identify as pagan. Which, here's the thing, dual faith very technically could be identified as pagan, totally fine. Um, if you want to identify me as a pagan creator, that's also totally fine. I just don't use that label and I feel like to put myself under the pagan label or under the Catholic label is to do a dishonor to my practice as a folk magic and to the nuances and cultural context of Italian folk magic. And I know that the vibe I have is correct because the amount of Italians and Italian Americans that were like, yes, you hit the nail on the head. You're absolutely right. I feel the same way. Even the amount of folk practitioners who were saying they feel the same way was like hundreds, hundreds of them. But for some reason, I think it's very interesting and very telling that there was an equal amount of both pagans and Catholics or Christians on my page getting angry at me because I didn't identify as a pagan or because I semi-identified as a Catholic because I had put myself in this place in between both of them, this liminal space, this space that I recognize as dual faith, which once again, I was talking to Kitchen Toad about this and I find it so interesting because the term dual faith was actually found in anthropological papers. 
It's not a made up word. It's an anthropological term for practices like mine, folk magic, that are, that like syncretized with Catholicism and have other things in there too. It's like very wild to me that people were so upset over that term because it's literally an anthropology term. It was found in academic papers, but you guys don't like it because you feel like I'm just a pagan. Hate to tell you, bud, you don't get to tell me how to identify in my personal practice. If you feel like I'm a pagan, so be it. You can call me whatever you want, but personally, I am allowed to say I don't identify with this. But I will say this, very telling that the amount of pagans in my comment section matched the amount of Catholics, trad Catholics, telling me what I should identify as or telling me I was wrong and they knew better than me or telling me that I should just identify as pagan because that's basically what it is. And I think that there is a lot of people <laughs> in the pagan community who continue to mimic the kind of forcing structure onto other practitioners that we see a lot in like Christianity. That's all I have to say. Um, and I'm sure that there are gonna be people in my comment section that are like, how dare you compare paganism to Catholicism? I'm not, I am not, they're not the same. I'm just pointing out the fact that the two groups of people in my comment section that were very angry at me for how I identified were saying very similar things to each other, probably from different places, but they were saying the same shit. If the shoe fits, my guys if the shoe fits. So that's my own popular opinion, is that sometimes I think that people in the pagan communities can mimic behavior that they very much hate or say that they are against or say that they very much don't like. And I think that's just humans in general, not just pagans, that's every community. There's always gonna be someone who's like, I hate this, I would never do this, this is wrong, and then they'll turn around and kind of do it in a slightly different way. Um, that's just, the internet <laughs> and the community as a whole. And here's the thing is like, I'm still friends with a lot of pagans. I'm still friends with a lot of folk practitioners who identify as pagans. I am very much friends with a lot of people or folk practitioners who identify as Catholics too. And both of them are like, yeah, dude, you're valid. Whatever you wanna do. Because folk magic isn't just to me one thing or the other. And even in all those cases, people were like, well, technically I'd be this but we're not technically. We don't wanna be technical. Why operate on a technicality when there's another term used in academic journals right there that makes more sense? And those are all the questions you guys sent me. I mean, what a day. That was like a lot. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching. Remember to drink water. Um, remember to like, subscribe, comment, and turn the bell on, but absolutely no pressure, and have an amazing rest of your day. Siate Benedicti.